Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to you know introduce everyone to Substrate. Um, this is what uh, you know is a powerful blockchain framework for you know building on Polkadot and, and building parachains. Um, you know, I'm Peter. I work on the uh, ecosystem development team at Parity, and specifically focused on more of the growth side of things. So my job is to talk with you know founders, CTOs, and, and other folks to help them build on Polkadot and use Substrate for their business needs. Um, so let's go on to the next slide about Parity so I can share more. Okay, so Parity was founded by key alumni of the Ethereum Foundation in 2015. Uh, most notably is Dr. Gavin Wood, who's one of the co-founders of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, he was very instrumental in you know, launching that, you know, building the technology, describing and specifying you know, the Ethereum virtual machine and implementing the first client. Um, and as a side note, you know, Substrate has like a, a very vibrant community that, you know, likes to help and, you know, share with each other. Um, and, you know, you might even see Gav, you know, on our technical chat and element. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And, you know, since the, the last four years or so, you know, Parity Technologies has really become, you know, one of the most widely accepted and, you know, recognized uh, infrastructure providers, you know, in the blockchain space, uh, you know, having built the Parity Ethereum client and now with Polkadot and Substrate. And over these four years, Parity has grown from, you know, like a few people to, you know, over 140 with, you know, several highly respected individuals and, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networking, distributed computing, um, and the Rust programming language in particular. And Parity also works, you know, fairly closely with the Web3 Foundation, which is this nonprofit organization that provides, you know, research to advance the stability of the Web3 ecosystem. Uh, next slide. Okay, so a lot of people have heard about Polkadot, and Polkadot is really a protocol, and the components that I'm about to describe enable a network of many blockchains. At the heart of Polkadot is the relay chain, which is responsible for the network's shared security, consensus, and cross-chain interoperability. Uh, we also have pair chains, which are sovereign blockchains that connect to the relay chain. So this means at its core, Polkadot is really an enabler of many different layer one blockchains or pair chains as we call them. And this means that Polkadot provides shared infrastructure in order to allow individual teams to focus on their business logic, which Dan's gonna go you know, into more detail with Substrate. One of the nice features of Polkadot is that if you build your own parachain, you don't have to search for validators and you know, beg them to validate on your chain. As long as you pay for security, you know, whether that's with parachain slot auctions or with the pay-as-you-go model with pair threads, uh, you get access to the security of the Polkadot relay chain, and this allows you to participate in the core infrastructure. I also want to touch base on uh, collators, since you know most people are you know pretty familiar with validators and you know how validators you know secure the relay chain by staking their dots, validating proofs, and participating in consensus. So collators, on the other hand, those guys are just broadcasters, or you know like as Akala puts it proof of liveness to show that the chain is there, uh, but they can't impact the individual security of the pair chains. Uh, so basically what they do is they provide proofs to the validators and, and that's what their role is there. I also touched on before, uh, but we have pair threads and what they do is they provide this pay-as-you-go model uh, that provides the security of the relay chain, uh, but with less performance. So you could start with like a pair thread and then like later upgrade to a pair chain if that makes sense for you. You know, there's always like an upgrade path, uh, you know, for Polkadot, whether you're, you know, building on an EVM compatible chain, you know, that supports Solidity smart contracts or, you know, whether you're building with pair threads. The last two components uh, I wanna mention is that Polkadot uses bridges to other chains like Bitcoin and Ethereum and the XCMP protocol to communicate with other parrot chains. So in theory, what this means is that you can have, you know, multiple relay chains in the future that's connected to each other, you know, to scale this even more. And this is what we're illustrating on this slide. 
Um, in general, the Polkadot ecosystem is, you know, comprised of many blockchains. And, you know, this includes teams like Akala, uh, which is aiming to be the DeFi hub on Polkadot, uh, Moonbeam, uh, which has an EVM compatible chain and supports a lot of the existing Ethereum tooling, and Centrifuge, uh, which is building a chain that enables users to bring assets on chain as NFTs. Uh, we have over, you know, 120 teams building in the Polkadot ecosystem, and, you know, we'd love for you to join. Like, even if you guys have some crazy ideas, let us know. Uh, you know, we have a lot of resources, such as the Polkadot Venture Network, you know, our ecosystem fund. You know, the Polkadot Treasury has, like, over $35 million uh, in DOTS, and Kusama has something like $9 million. Um, and we also have our grants program to, you know, to support you if you're looking to build on Polkadot. All right, uh, so now I'm going to go pass this along to Dan, who's going to discuss more about Substrate in detail. That was awesome, Peter. That was a great introduction. I really appreciate that. And I just want to say, uh, Peter said, like, maybe if you have some some crazy ideas, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, like, especially if you have some crazy ideas, I hope that you come uh, chat with us. Those are definitely the people that, that I like to chat with. Um, so before I pick back up with the slides, I just want to take like a quick second to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dan Forbes. I'm a developer advocate with Parity Technologies. So I'm a software engineer, but nowadays I don't write as much code. I spend more of my time talking about code with other software software engineers and helping them solve their problems. Um, so I, I work at Parity Technologies and work a lot with the Substrate framework in particular. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to kind of continue to build on the awesome groundwork that Peter laid about this this vision of the Polkadot network and what it enables and provide just kind of some of my musings, if you will, on, on what we're doing here at Parity. Um, you know, as a software engineer, I think some of you may be familiar with this idea of like, when when do you continue to maintain a legacy system because there's a lot of dependencies on it and it's a big deal to like uh, upgrade? Or when do you kind of make that decision to upgrade to a new way of doing things? And the the internet, I think it's been pretty cool, but it's a little old. and what do I mean when I say that? Let's imagine, like, why did the internet start? How did it start? It started with some some researchers at places like Berkeley who wanted to share information with one another. And there was a, a high degree of trust amongst these people. They weren't sharing highly sensitive information. And so the network that they built uh, reflected th that use case and if you had asked those those people back then oh or is is amazon going to be a thing or you know paypal or whatever or online universities they would have been like i don't know about all that um and and so the 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 trust models the the primitives that exist around the internet they're not really designed to manage highly sensitive personal data. And so what we have now is like decades of legacy systems that are just kind of like clutched on to some pretty primitive networking capabilities. Um, and so what we're trying to do at Parity and at the Web3 Foundation is really provide new types of infrastructure that enable new ways for humans to communicate with one another that doesn't have the same types of trust models and maybe has more mature primitives and idioms around ideas like trust. And so one kind of idea that I want to advance as I begin talking about Substrate is how do the tools that we use impact the solutions that we create? What kinds of idioms and patterns of thinking are the tools themselves encouraging? And how does that inform the solutions that we create? And I think that is kind of what we're doing at a very high level, trying to create better patterns for interacting with one another at the you know kind of internet level so that people can, can communicate broadly with one another. And then I think 
the other thing uh, is that Substrate lays out some really awesome primitives. Um, I guess one thing I kind of forgot to say leading into this is I am super duper happy to be here for Berkeley. I see Jocelyn just chimed in. I've had some chance to work with Jocelyn over the past couple of weeks, and that's been amazing. But even before that, um, when I was first getting into the blockchain industry, one of the first things that I did was attend blockchain at Berkeley. I was a attending the career fair, representing a company, not parody at that time. And I happened to, to meet a very cool guy while I was there. And that very cool guy was Peter Haymond, who now works with me at parody technologies. So this is all to say that like, I, it's like what you guys do at Berkeley and the way that you bring together the blockchain community, it's had an impact on me personally. It's helped me network with new colleagues and meet new people and you're just doing awesome stuff. So yeah, we're, thank you so much for having us. Um, and I, I hope, yeah, it shows how excited we are. I'm gonna take a quick peek at the questions before I get started. Uh, so someone asked, will this <clears throat> session include setup? We're not gonna do like a guided, uh, like hands-on coding today. Uh, I'll, I'll be, honest. Uh, Substrate is built on Rust, which means that it kind of has long compile times, highly CPU intensive compile times, which doesn't make it super friendly for web conferencing. So what I'm going to do today is kind of give you a lot of the information that you need to kind of get started, walk you through some code, um, but we're not going to be doing like hands-on coding today. So sorry, I uh, uh, yeah, done answering. Uh, yes, Aaron, this is going to be recorded. Uh, the whole thing will be available later for recording. Uh, where can I find more basic info on blockchains and how Polkadot fits into that landscape? We're going to be talking a lot about that today, Jerry. I hope we just gave you a little bit of a introduction to that, but we'll talk about that some more. And can you explain... Can you explain with other chains in particular? Uh, like today, we're mostly here to talk about Substrate and the Polkadot network. We're not, that's what Peter and I do. So unfortunately, we're not really gonna be able to answer questions about other projects. Um, great questions though, please keep them coming. Um, and with that, I'm gonna kind of jump back into my slides if you don't mind. Let's see. You're doing great, <laughs> keep it up. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Yes, Peter's, I, I'm not going to be looking at the screen as much, um, but Peter's going to be monitoring the questions and everything. So if you guys, you know, want to chime in, uh, please do so. Okay, so Peter kind of set up this uh, amazing example, this, this great description of what the Polkadot network is. And so to kind of pick back up where Peter left off, the, the it, what I really want you to take away from this is, there's a lot of blockchains here. The Relay chain is a blockchain, the Polkadot network that we're kind of like building the official implementation of that client, but even that's an open source exercise. The collators, as Peter said, these are all blockchains that are being built by other product, uh, other companies. Um, and, and the Polkadot network doesn't really make sense if we don't have other people building blockchains. Parathreads are essentially blockchains. So it's a, a lot of blockchains that we envision in this ecosystem. And so we need a way for people to easily build blockchains, not just for the Polkadot network or even other Polkadot-like networks such as Kusama, but maybe other people have other reasons that they wanna build blockchains and they can use Substrate and Frame for that as well. And, and let's talk a little bit about what, what is Substrate and Frame. So very, you know, the one thing to always keep in mind, there's a lot of uh, terminology that can get thrown around. Substrate is a framework for building blockchains. And it's really kind of optimized for blockchains that fit into Polkadot-like networks, either as a relay chain or as a parachain, but that's not the only type of blockchains that it can build. The, the heart of Substrate is kind of this idea of <clears throat> very modular, flexible, customizable components. And there's also kind of a cool implementation detail that we'll dig into a little bit more that kind of sets Substrate apart. And that's this idea of runtimes, which we'll talk about what a runtime is, that are written in WebAssembly. Uh, as, as an introduction to WebAssembly, it's a portable binary format. So it's 
you compile code to WebAssembly, like maybe C++ code you can compile to WebAssembly, Rust you can compile to WebAssembly, and then it's sort of similar to Java in that it defines like a portable format that you can run the same binary on in many different environments. And this is gonna become really key to what sets Substrate apart, this use of WebAssembly runtimes. Uh, so these are some of the really core concepts of, of substrate. And now there's this other thing called frame. And frame is a system for runtime development. I, I know this idea of like a runtime may still sound a little abstract at the moment. I'm going to talk a lot more about runtimes in particular on the next slide. But for now, I just kind of want to lay out the, the terminology here. So we have substrate, which is a framework for building blockchains. One component of a blockchain is a runtime. And it's a very, very important component of the blockchain. And where a lot of the business logic happens, the, the unique proprietary business logic happens. And so in order to make that extra simple, we've built this other framework called Frame, which is libraries modules to simplify runtime development, but then also kind of advance some of these idioms and mindsets to use when, when building runtimes. One of these idioms that, that Frame uses is what I describe as like compositional development or, or whatever. So you may be familiar like with a, a JavaScript project, you compose a number of NPM packages, you kind of include those as dependencies, and you include those to create your project. In order to create <clears throat> a frame runtime, you compose different palettes, different modules that all contain business logic. You can mix these, you can match these, you know, ones that already exist, or of course you can build your own. So that's a, a high level kind of what is substrate, what is the problems that it solves, how is it approaching it, and, and kind of introducing this idea of frame. We're going to talk a lot more about this. So when you build a substrate project, you know, you, you pull some code down from GitHub, go through the readme, you know, build it, and you're, you finally get a binary that you can interact with that is going to be a blockchain node. And so what I have here is a not to scale depiction of one way to think about a substrate node. And as you can see, it's very modular, many different components. This is very key to what substrate is all about. Um, and so now let's start to dig in a little bit to the runtime. I, I've really talked about this a little bit and let's kind of dig into what this means. At, at its heart, a blockchain is a mechanism for allowing a decentralized, trustless network of participants to come to consensus on the state of a system as it evolves over time. And so let's kind of narrow in on this, the state of a system. The runtime is really this kind of state machine. So it describes parameters that can be adjusted and then the rules around which those parameters can be adjusted. And so one of the ways that I like to encourage people to think about this, I don't know, when I was learning in CS school about computer science and stuff, they would talk about like these big old computers that you would stick a card into that would have some like instructions like, okay, take this thing, move it here, take that thing, move it there. And it was like a, a kind of a pretty clear description of like a state machine. You There's some thing that can be manipulated in some way, this big old computer, and there's some piece of information that describes some changes to that state that you want to make. And, and then maybe that describes a valid state transition, or maybe it doesn't, but those are kind of the rules that you're playing by, and those are the opportunities that you have to, to make changes to it. So if we think about the blockchain runtime, it's kind of like that, that big old computer, except obviously it's much more powerful than that. It's written in Rust, WebAssembly, all this kind of stuff. And then the transactions 
are the cards that go in to that runtime and say, okay, I want you to make these changes. And so then when you think about what a block is, a block is like a whole stack of those cards that we have decided, we have come to consensus as a trustless network of participants around this idea that they represent valid state transitions in the runtime. So there is the runtime logic that defines what what these valid state transitions are. And then there's the runtime storage, which is kind of like a snapshot of the state at a point in time. And one thing that you can see is that the runtime is actually an element in runtime storage. This is really, really unique and something that really sets Substrate apart. This is enabled by the WASM runtimes that we talked about, that our, our runtimes are compiled down to this portable binary format. And so it may be possible that there is some native compiled runtime in this node that's running here. That's what this executor does, is it looks and it says, can I use this runtime in runtime storage? Or maybe should I try to use some native runtime if it'll be more performant or whatever? But that's kind of like an optimization concern. What really makes Substrate special is the idea that the definition of the runtime itself, the rules of the state machine are actually a part of the state that the network is coming to consensus around. So what that enables is this idea of forkless runtime upgrades. While the network is running and without needing to rely on any channel of trust to distribute the new runtime logic, you certainly don't need to distribute a new binary. You just make a transaction on the blockchain and boom, you have new upgraded blockchain logic. Maybe it implements new features or maybe it fixes a bug because people make mistakes and we make bugs and that's a thing that needs to be dealt with. And so this is all kind of baked into Substrate. And so I know I just talked a long time about this and the next slide is gonna go by really quickly, but this, this concept of First of all, what a runtime is, what's the substrate definition of a runtime, and in particular, this idea of the runtime as an element of runtime storage is super duper important. Peter, what do you think? We got any questions there? I'm going to take a quick look. We got a couple questions. I'm going to I'm going to answer. Oh, hey, what's up? I see Mike. I'm going to I'm going to answer your question, Mike. If the runtime is in the runtime storage, does that make it easily upgradable? I love it. Uh, yes, you got it. Um will there be any other session with you guys help in setting up? Absolutely. If 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 we can help with those sessions, we will do that. Today there's a lot of just kind of like general stuff to cover, but we can help with some of those setup uh, sessions as well. Um, all right, let's go back over here. Okay, so we just talked a lot about what the runtime is. So the runtime is the rules around how we can change our state. The state, a snapshot of it, is represented in runtime storage. And part of that state is actually the definition of the runtime. This is all implemented in kind of like the default substrate node implementation as a, a highly performant Rust key value database. Substrate is a Rust framework. And so it's a highly performant key value database. Right now we're using RocksDB, which is very well known in the Rust ecosystem. We are developing ParityDB, which is a more highly optimized key value database for this specific use case. But this just goes to show how modular all this stuff is. We can swap that out at some point. And in fact, that is the plan. I mentioned that a block is like a stack of transactions. And so in addition to maintaining like a snapshot of the current state, we also of course maintain like the archive, the immutable history of the blockchain. And that is stored in the same underlying storage as the runtime and the runtime storage. The block database is in the same RocksDB or in the future ParityDB. So I hope that kind of makes this whole section of this 
pretty clear. And now I can relatively quickly, compared to that pretty long uh, description, uh, relatively quickly go through the rest of this diagram now. So I mentioned that like the blockchain is a way for a, a decentralized network of participants to come to consensus on the state of a system as it evolves over time. So at the end of the day, we want people to be able to interact with this and make transactions and, and do whatever they need to do. And so they, they do that through the RPC server. This is how basically transactions are made or uh, maybe you make storage queries or whatever. So in the case that you want to submit a transaction, that would go into the transaction pool here. And just once again, highlighting that this is all very modular. So if you like the default substrate way of doing things, we have this node template, which I'll talk about in a little bit. If you think that the way that it's all working in the node template is just fine, and it's the way we do it in Polkadot, so we like it and, and we you know, recommend it, then you can just use that and it's ready for you out of the box. If your use case requires some custom logic, or if you wanna make some, some other types of changes to the transaction pool, you can do that as well. So that's kind of just reminding that, that another very important part of Substrate, in addition to the upgradable runtimes, is this idea of everything being very composable and flexible and modular. So the RPC server is how the participants in the network interact with these nodes that are running, managing the network. If they want to make a transaction, that goes into the transaction pool or maybe they just want to make a, a storage query, learn a little bit about the current state of storage, or maybe it's an archive node that's running. And so they want to reach into the block database and get some history about the historical state. Now, of course, do you have yeah, a question, have, Peter? Uh, yeah, we have, we have a few questions popping up cool. here. Maybe you can uh, cover the first one with the runtime storage. You did myself. I was going to take a sip of water, but I'll just do that. Then. No problem. Does runtime storage also enable upgrading of the block itself? Um, the fact that the definition of the runtime is an element in storage enables runtime upgrades. It enables uh, upgrades of the blockchain itself, not necessarily the block itself. A block is like a snapshot of uh, a set of transactions. Would, uh, let's see, would this suffer from mempool front run like Ethereum? That's an excellent question. I don't know that. I know that people are considering those kinds of things. I'm not here to tell you that, you know, Substrate is immune from any type of attack and it's a nominated proof of stake protocol that we use. And so we can share some more details about that protocol, the, the Web3 Foundation research. Um, I don't have the technical knowledge to answer the question about the mempool right now, but that's an excellent question. You can join our technical chat. And as Peter mentioned, there's lots of other nerds up to and including Gavin Wood, who may be down to chat with you about that. I'm completely novice to Polkadot. I love it. I was too at one time. Uh, can you please explain what is Aura, Babe, etc. in consensus? These these are really good questions. I'm not going to get too deeply into them because I'm not an expert in them. These The people who develop these consensus algorithms, they have like PhDs and I'm just a lonely computer science dude, just a bachelor's degree. Um, so uh, I think we can share some more. Uh, Peter, just help me remember yeah. to share some more thoughts on consensus. I don't want to like jump off my screen right now, but that's a really good question, Joy. We'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah, let me let me see if I can find some some help. Yeah, if you could share like on the the glossary on substrate.dev, we provide some really good definitions and then in those definitions there are lots of links out to the um to other research papers and stuff. 
Great question, guys. Thank you. Please keep them coming. And, and actually, really, the questions about consensus kind of get into what we're talking about next. So you, you have, you know, maybe right now you're just thinking like, okay, I'm running this blockchain node on my computer. But of course, there's, uh, there are other people running the same node on their computer, or, or, you know, at least the same runtime logic, maybe not the same node, but the same runtime logic. And so you need a way to communicate with them. And in particular, you want to gossip these transactions that are coming in through the transaction pool. This is potentially where like mempool type concerns come into play. Um, and so there's some lib P2P networking that we use. Lib P2P is actually a specific multi-protocol networking stack that Substrate uses. And it's really what enables flexible consensus mechanisms like enabling people to use Aura or Babe. And decide whether or not to include a finality gadget like grandpa. So today we're not going to get into really what these advanced topics mean, but what I want you to take away from the discussion today is that in a substrate node, this is modular logic that's encapsulated in the networking layer and the consensus layer. And even these two layers are, are separate from one another. So it's very fine tuned opportunities to A, learn about all this stuff and understand, modify it and build on it if that's what you wanna do. Everything we do is open source. And like I said at the beginning, the crazier your idea is, the more interested I am in the, the diagram here, the, the nodes are going to gossip the transactions across the network to one another, deal with all this through the consensus engine. Eventually, they're going to come to some consensus on what the canonical state of the chain is, and that's all going to be persisted back into the key value database. So there's, you know, the node, there's all this stuff that's going on, and so we embed a Prometheus server in there to provide you with some, some nice logic, uh, some nice metrics, I should say. So this is kind of a really big picture on, you know, what is really substrate from the viewpoint of the substrate node and kind of the different components that it encapsulates. So this next slide is actually going to go pretty quickly because I already talked a lot about what the runtime is and storage and all that kind of stuff. So let's just kind of review this really quickly. The runtime is, you can kind of think of it as like a set of rules around valid state transitions. And then the runtime also defines the APIs that, that allow you to make those state transitions. So you can basically think it, it defines the types of transactions that you're able to make to the blockchain. That, that's how these APIs manifest through that RPC server. Um, the state transitions are persisted to storage, both as like snapshots of the, the state right now, runtime storage, and then blocks a uh, historical state. The definition of the runtime is an element in storage. The rules that describe how you can change storage it is a part of the storage. That's like this unbelievably elegant, unique thing that really sets Substrate apart and it enables forkless runtime upgrades. And now what we're gonna get into is this idea of frame, which is a little bit more of a specific way of building runtimes for Substrate-based chains for Polkadot-like um, networks. Frame is a Rust framework, so it compiles to WebAssembly, of course. But going back to this idea that the, the runtime is an element in storage, it's WebAssembly, this is one of the big requirements for a substrate runtime, and, and there aren't a lot of other ones. You know, there's obviously certain APIs that need to be implemented, but there are other people out there writing frameworks in other languages that compile to WASM, WebAssembly, other than Frame for writing runtimes. So that just is another depiction of how modular all of this is. So we talked, I, I already mentioned the fact that Frame basically takes this kind of compositional approach 
so this is just a depiction of that. We have all of these palettes that we've already written like around some very complicated things like consensus. So we have aura and grandpa, which is finality. So you can pull from these. Let's see, what are some of the other things? Let, let me talk for one second about this idea here, this contracts palette, because and, and we have the EVM palette here. Uh, you may be very familiar with this concept of smart contracts as a way of interacting with the blockchain. And that is definitely something that substrate based chains do, but it's really only one thing that they do. <clears throat> a smart contract in a smart contract platform, there are mechanisms that allow your users to deploy custom logic to your blockchain. And, and there's all sorts of cryptography that allows that logic to be deployed in a trustless way, in a scalable way, that you don't have to worry about it consuming all of your resources. But that comes with overhead. You don't just get all of that scalability and security for free. You have to pay for it. And so if your blockchain doesn't require people to deploy custom logic, you don't have to use the contracts palette. You don't have to include smart contract capability in your blockchain. But let's say that you're building a gaming chain where you're like building a platform for blockchain games. Now it really makes a lot of sense to me. Maybe you want to allow people to deploy smart contracts to your chain. Maybe you want to build a DeFi chain and you want to leverage the large amount of tooling and, and smart contracts that exist in the Ethereum ecosystem. Well, we have a palette that implements the EVM and there's another whole project that I have, we're not even going to talk about in this presentation today. I guess I'll mention it right now. It's called Frontier and it's a lot of layers around the RPC and the consensus mechanisms that need to sit on top of the Ethereum virtual machine in order to provide full Ethereum compatibility. So basically there's all the mechanisms and capabilities that you need today to allow people with existing Ethereum, EVM, bytecode, smart contract logic to deploy their code to a smart contract chain and use all the tooling, Truffle, Remix, everything that they're used to using. That's all, all of that is just in the EVM palette and in Frontier that I'm talking about. Then if you want what I may call like kind of next generation smart contract capabilities, we have our own smart contract palette that you can deploy to your runtime. And, and now people, of course, these are WebAssembly smart contracts because we love WebAssembly at, at Parity. So this is one type of capability. There's lots of capabilities around governance. This is something I haven't really gotten into yet. It's something that is very exciting to me. Um, there's this issue of technical scalability. And I kind of talked about the fact that upgradability is really important to technical scalability because as all my software engineers know, people make mistakes, especially software engineers, we make mistakes. And so in order to create a scalable system, you need to upgrade it and change it. But now with the blockchain, okay, it's wonderful that we have that technical capability, but how do we do that in a way that's trustless and how do we provide the primitives and the idioms for people to vote like with an elections palette on what runtime upgrades they want to make you know so oh look at this elections here twice it's a really important palette but we're only including it once um so you know there's an elections palette to help you make elections there's a you know collective for creating on-chain governance bodies. This is like the Polkadot Council is an instance of the collective palette. That's what the Polkadot Council is. Uh, then like there's the identity palette. So if you want your runtime to expose rich primitives so that users can identify themselves, you use the identity palette. So the takeaway from this is that when you're building with frame, you compose a runtime as a set of palettes which are just modules that encapsulate business logic. And we have a lot of palettes out there 
that have a lot of powerful features that are audited and in use in production today in the Polkadot network. And it's very possible for you to build your own palettes that encapsulate your own logic. So let's talk about that. What does that look like? What's in a frame? This is my uh, bad programmer humor. Like what's in a name? I think that's maybe Shakespeare. Um, so what's in a frame? What, what's in a frame palette in particular? Um, th what this diagram is meant to represent, and big shout out to my colleagues who do these diagrams. As you can probably tell, I'm a word person. I don't really do images very well. Uh, so thanks to, to my friends who helped create these. Peter, do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah. I w maybe you, you saw me uh, appear on here. So I can hear. You can hear. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's my it's my wooden chair probably. Um, <laughs> so I, I think I, I'll just like hop in. If you don't mind, I'm just taking a short break here. I'm, I'm just going to like hop in here and uh, maybe answer some of these questions. Um, and, and then we'll just, you know, keep moving forward. Um, the first one says, Dan, I think you're helping out on both courses. How is the uh, Berkeley Substrate course different from the Industry Connect course? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, did, did we hit uh, start answering that one? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. What's up, John? Um, so I'm not exactly sure. So there is a, a course. It's called uh, Building Web 3 or something. Jocelyn, maybe you can help me with the exact name of the course. That's a Berkeley course. Um, I'm helping out a little bit with that, but you know, there's a Professor Luke who's gonna be teaching that. Um, and then there's the, the Industry Connect Substrate course, which is created by Brian Chen. And I'm involved with that uh, along with some other people at Parity. Um, <clears throat> so the Industry Connect course is like a, a boot camp, like a traditional kind of like uh, online certification program. Um, <clears throat> I don't really feel comfortable speaking for for Berkeley at this time. Uh, so I'll share some more information about the Industry Connect course. I'm glad that you're asking about that. It's a super exciting thing. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let the Berkeley people answer questions about Berkeley. Cool, cool. And then uh, I'll, I'll probably answer the next one. So it's great. You know, what is the what's the best sort of comparison with Polkadot versus the competitors. So the closest thing to like Polkadot is, is probably Cosmos. Um, uh, Cosmos, I, I actually used to work at Tendermint. So Cosmos is like this modular framework um, and, and Polkadot's a, a bit different. Um, I think what sets Polkadot apart really is that uh, Polkadot enables you to, you know, build, you know, your pair chain or, you know, your pair thread, but you don't have to go, you know, looking for your own validator set. And we also take care of, lo of lo a lot of the interoperability between different chains. And so this really like sets you up in the future, you know, for a highly performant chain, um, you know, for whatever your business use case is. So I think that's really powerful. Um, and, and then like, pro like the, and then like the last point I want to make is like, in general, just the interest in Polkadot is super high. So if you compare like, you know, Ethereum's ecosystem and like, say like, you know, what's the next biggest ecosystem outside of Ethereum? Like I would argue like Polkadot is probably one of the biggest. Um, so if you're looking to like, you know, build on Polkadot, you're gonna also get access to several teams within that ecosystem. That's also gonna help to grow your use case as opposed to other chains that, you know, may not have that adoption. Um, we, we have an awesome yeah. ecosystem. Like I personally take great pride in it. It's a, it's a lot of fun to participate in. So yeah, totally agree with you, Peter. For sure, for sure. Uh, let's see, Kyle has a question here. If we're building a DAP and we want and we prefer to build our own substrate based chain, but we're concerned about the high barrier of becoming a pair chain, how would we connect? Um, so there's so there's a few things there. Um, if you're trying to build a parachain um, and you think there's a high barrier to entry, you don't have to build a parachain. Uh, you know, you can build a parathread, or if you already have existing Solidity code, you can build on an EVM compatible chain. Um, but if you did want to build a parachain, you could also uh, like use the crowdfunding module to you know uh, get access uh, and you know raise enough funds to bond so you can you know become a parachain, um, you know, and get access to the security of the relay chain. So 
Um, we definitely, you know, have several options uh, there and, you know, I'm happy to talk offline about that. Uh, oh, and he also mentioned Plasm. So um, one, one other comment on that is we actually have uh, several EVM compatible chains. So, you know, unlike other chains that might just have like one or two, we actually have like four or five. Uh, the four I remember uh, the most is uh, Akala uses uh, the EVM palette. Uh, we also have Moonbeam, which is like specifically uh, geared towards, um, you know, being Ethereum compatible. Um, and then we also have Plasm, which is focused a little bit more on like layer two scaling. Um, so happy to put you in touch with, you know, any of those teams if you need to. Um, I think the next one would be for you, Dan. Yep. Okay. So let's see. Uh, is testing support included in the framework? Uh, yes. Uh, there's definitely examples of what it looks like to, to unit test substrate and frame code. There's a benchmarking framework that's included. Um, I wouldn't say we're quite at the level of maturity of like Jasmine or, or for Angular, um, but already there's a great project out there called Halva, which is uh, it's a great name if you if you're a Halva lover like myself, and it's a it's an ode to the Truffle framework, so it's a confection. Um, it's a pretty sweet framework. Uh, so that's not made by Parity, but it you know there's a there's tooling out there that exists for this kind of stuff. So we have like an official benchmarking framework for Frame, and then there's un unofficial but but community tooling like halva let's see uh what magic layer provides the safety sandbox i i believe that that would be wasm wasm is that sandbox environment um so yes you would want to we have our frame palettes audited the the palettes that are included in the polka dot relay chain are audited so yeah like just like you get smart contracts audited in the ethereum ecosystem it would be very common to get a pallet audited for substrate mm -hmm. and jerry i really like this question because it's like it's it's almost impossible to like overemphasize these distinctions. And, and I, I think there is some room to kind of tweak some of the things that you said there. So let me try to, to make sure everything's in line. Polkadot is a protocol, first and foremost, that, that describes a, a network of interconnected blockchains. So there's a couple things that are key to the Polkadot protocol. One of them is this, uh, this idea that the blockchains can talk to one another. The chains that are connected to the same relay chain can talk to one another. And then the other is this idea that they're all deriving shared security and shared infrastructure from the relay chain. So the Polkadot protocol describes a type of blockchain network that enables those two things. And then we have real actual concrete blockchain networks like the Polkadot network and the Kusama network that are implementing that protocol. Substrate is a Rust framework, just like Angular is a JavaScript framework. And I, I really like the comparison between Angular and Substrate because I think they're both pretty like heavyweight opinionated frameworks, if I will. Um, so Substrate is a Rust framework for building blockchains. I would say that it's optimized for building blockchains for Polkadot-like networks, but it can also build other types of blockchains. Um, and if you're using Substrate, you may decide to use Frame to build your runtime. And if you're building your runtime with Frame, then the individual units of logic are going to be called pallets. So great question. Um, all right. And I'm going to jump back into the slides. Although I love the questions coming, I know like the slides can get a little like heavy and technical. So it's nice to kind of uh, have these little breaks. But yeah, let's jump back into the slides. I'm going to. No, this is good. Share my maybe, screen. Go ahead, Peter. One other comment I would add mm -hmm. that, um, you know, kind of similar to how we've seen like, you know, popular smart contracts on Ethereum, like, you know, compounds governance, you know, contracts or, you know, like Uniswap that a lot of people are using. We also like, we'll probably see the similar stuff with like pallets too. Um, and we actually have a marketplace for this, like where the pallets are going to be. So, um, you know, feel free to check that out. I can share the links to that. 
I'm, I'm looking at the what we like to call the troll box over here, and I see my programmers uh, having the React versus Angular battle, and I knew as soon as I mentioned Angular that that was coming. Um, I'm probably these days, I know that it's like not the coolest thing to say that something's like Angular. Angular is like the old, like not super cool thing, and React is the hip thing these days. Um, but that... I'm I'm kind of old and not super cool, and, and Angular is what I'm used to. So that that's the analogy that I have. All right, Peter, I'm going to take you off video and share my screen again, and we'll get back into these slides and learn about what's in a frame. Perfect. All right. All right. Okay, so yes, I was uh, thanking my designer friends who designed this for me. And so let's take a, let's, you know, kind of zoom back in here with this uh, image of the runtime. So one terminology that we use a lot in substrate development is the outer runtime and, and then the inner palette logic. And so your runtime is going to be composed of a lot of different modules. One type of module, let's go back here and see, I would have to, there's, okay, we didn't, I can't believe I didn't include the balances palette on here. That's a really important one because even though substrate based chains can be used for a lot more than just cryptocurrency and tokenization, you know, nominated proof of stake and the consensus mechanism and everything, it requires a native currency. And so one of the very important things that's going to exist in your runtime is some definition of the native currency. And there's a palette for that. It's called the balances palette. And, and there's actually many different types of balances palette. There's a, a awesome guy named Brian Chen, who some of you may be familiar with because he works for Akala. And he's been very instrumental in creating a community set of palettes called the Open Runtime Module Library, and he created the Multi-Assets Palette, which is another type of native currency that you could use for your chain. And it's also possible that your runtime could have different different currencies in it. Maybe you want to use one currency for the staking and another currency to pay for the smart contracts, for instance. That could be a pretty common use case, actually frame and substrate makes that pretty easy compared to other things where you would really have to basically just start from scratch. So getting back to this diagram, you have all these palettes in your runtime and, and they kind of need to know about one another sometimes. Like if you're using a particular type of currency to pay for smart contracts, then those two pallets maybe need to know about one another. Maybe the currency doesn't need to know about the smart contract, but the smart contract needs to know about the currency. And so that's all handled through this trait configuration interface. So this is how you take elements from the outer runtime and plug them into the pallet so that everyone's kind of speaking the same language. If you're a, a software engineer, this is like bread and butter. You don't program against implementation, you program against interfaces. And so this trait configuration interface, this is a little bit of jargon here, but this is kind of the element of a palette that allows you to wire together all of these dependencies in a flexible way that focuses on the interface and not the implementation. So this is how you, you really kind of bind the palette to the runtime. And then once the palette is bound to the runtime, if you will, you're obviously going to want to do your business logic. So I hope you sort of took away from the discussion of the node how important storage is to all of this. If what we're doing is coming to consensus on the state of a system, storage is the state. And so frame defines abstractions and idioms around blockchain storage. So it provides like different data structures like a map, you know, a vector, these types of things. It makes it easy to store it in the runtime. And so when you write a frame palette, a lot of what you do is you define these storage primitives and, and the rules around which that storage can be modified. Sometimes those rules are going to be met and you'll emit an event to let off-chain people know that that was successful. 
Sometimes it won't be successful and you'll need to omit an error, but frame makes this all very easy. You know, it's all kind of like plug and play, if you will. It's a, a framework that provides nice, easy idioms. So hearkening back to what I said at the beginning, frame is a tool. It's a, it's a really well-designed tool, if I will, that, that really makes it easy to solve blockchain type problems. So dispatchable transactions, these are the APIs that we talked about that, that allow you to interact with storage. So Frame has a nice, easy framework for doing that. And then Frame palettes can interact with one another beyond just, I guess, the this trait configuration interface is programming to the interface instead of the implementation. If you want a more program to the implementation or more... Um, enable communication between palettes as opposed to between a palette in the runtime or between a palette in the outside world. A palette can also expose a public interface for kind of like inter palette communication. And, and then frame other than just like this idea of a palette, there's other primitives, other idioms that frame sets up that makes it really easy to, to define complex, powerful blockchain logic, like this idea of an origin, which is like where a transaction, but even it, it kind of goes above that a little bit, where a state transition originates from. A transaction is one type of origin, and then you can dig even more into that and, and say like, okay, who signed this transaction? But then there's other types of origins within substrate and frame. Like maybe a block author has directly inserted some type of information. And so the origin is this kind of nice way of thinking about this and then defining ways to put access control around it. That's really what the origin primitive is all about, is access controls. So really fine-grained fine access controls for your blockchain. And then if you're, if you're upgrading the blockchain, because we're using WASM runtimes in Substrate, all Substrate blockchains are going to have this upgradability aspect but frame is like hyper optimized around it i talked about all of these pre-designed palettes that exist around the governance of upgradability so that's all existing within frame and then there's all kinds of other again primitives and idioms that exist within the framework like how do you define the version of a blockchain and so that kind of exists outside of the palette layer, but it's still part of frame. So, so frame is obviously my favorite way for building substrate runtimes. So we're kind of getting to the end of the theory part now, and I hope you can tell why, unfortunately, I'm not able to quite get hands on in this talk there's so much to cover just kind of like the mindset and and getting things right that before and then the compile times, unfortunately, are not the greatest. I'm, I'm going to have to warn you about that one. Um, that, that, you know, before we can really get into the code, there's just a lot of talking that we have to get through. But let's get into some code a little bit. Um, I'm going to zoom through all of these. So there's all these template projects that are out there for you. But right now, let's go look at the node template. Can you still see my screen, Peter? Can you see GitHub? You're muted, so I can't hear you. Can someone let me know if you're able to see like GitHub? You, okay, cool, you can see GitHub, perfect. Okay, so this is the Substrate node template. Uh, let me go ahead and share this link. Can't, no worries, Peter. As long as people can see the slides, that's perfect, perfect, great. So I just shared the link for what I'm looking at. Um, again, I would more encourage you to like look at it on your own afterwards, but I want to give you kind of like a tour of the node template. But this is a fully working blockchain, substrate-based blockchain. This will build one of those things that we were looking at with all those blocks in it. And, and this is really, it's a minimal frame-based substrate node. So the runtime is written in frame for kind of getting started with substrate. 
So let's start by looking at the the palette that comes with this, the runtime that, that this blockchain defines includes many palettes and one of them is kind of this toy template palette. I'm gonna go ahead and I always forget to do that. So I'm gonna congratulate myself for remembering to do that. Okay, so this is actually what the trait configuration interface this is actually this name is going to change really soon and actually if i'm honest this whole api is going to change really soon but the underlying concepts are not going to change just the kind of the the high level interface but all the idioms are going to be the same just a, a more friendly uh syntax for declaring it but th this uh trait configuration interface in rust a, a interface is called a trait so this is like the rust keyword trait and then this is the name of the trait which unfortunately right now is trait terrible naming in the future this is going to be called config which is a much better more evocative name so trait is a rust keyword this trait happens to be named trait and this is what we use to do all that interface based binding that I was talking about between the outer runtime and the inner palette. So for instance, one of the things that I mentioned is that your, your palette wants to emit events. Maybe your palette doesn't want to emit events and that's flexible. You can work with or without that if you want. But if you do want to emit events, you kind of need to share some understanding with the outer runtime of what an event is. And so in the most minimal, case i think what the the trait configuration interface will define is kind of this event type so that your palette can emit events so that's what you see here but maybe if you need to know other things about the outer runtime like a type of currency that's being used or something like that you could also define that here and maybe i'll even show you what that looks like in a little bit um this is where you define your storage items so right here you can see that we just have a single storage item it's just one unsigned integer value but this is what's called a rust macro frame makes very heavy use of a macro language uh rust macros are code that helps you write well, no, they don't help you write other code. Macros are code that writes other code. And so you can really almost think of frame as like its own programming language. When you talk about code writing other code, that's a programming language actually. Um, and so the fact that frame makes such heavy use of macros, it's almost moving like out of this framework and into this kind of like programming language realm. Um, and so just like Java and JavaScript and Rust have their own definition of a hash map, um, Frame has its own definition of a hash map. So within this decal storage macro, this is where you know, you kind of drop in all of the storage structures that your palette is going to be using. And some of them may be really simple, like an unsigned integer value, but others may be like a hash map or something like that. There's more complex items. And, and this is where you can go to learn more about that. This is where you define the types of events that your palette may emit. And if, if your palette's not going to emit events, you don't have to define this. And then you wouldn't have to include this either. But events basically are just enums. And so that's how you let people know about changes. Off-chain observers or participants in the network know about what happened on the blockchain. An error is how you let them know that something bad happened. And, and again, it's just an enum. Uh, decal module, this is where you're basically defining those transactions. So here you see that this is a, a Rust function. And this is the code that's going to be invoked when someone calls the do something transaction. Um, so you see here that this is using an origin, like we talked about, this kind of uh, identity, identifying where a uh, some off-chain data came from. That's really what an origin is. It, it identifies the source of off-chain data. And so the, a very common source of off-chain data is a transaction, which is the signed origin. 
So you see here we have some really friendly helper functions. First of all, let's make sure that this is signed and not maybe something that was inserted by the block author, like I talked about. And then once we make sure that it was signed, we can actually figure out who signed it and get the account ID. And then there's all kinds of opportunities to do complex logic around validating whether or not this person can call this transaction. Uh, and so then you, you know, you do whatever runtime logic, you update your storage, and, and then you emit your event to let people know that that was successful. Um, weights are, at, at this level of discussion, we can liken them to gas in the Ethereum ecosystem. It's a way of accounting for the resources that are consumed by the execution of a transaction so that you can ensure that the resources are not exhausted. You need to account for them. And so we account for them with weights in frame. And there is a whole benchmarking framework that helps make sure that you define these weights in a really scalable way. We make that really easy for you with frame. Uh, this is another example of a transaction. We call them dispatchables. It's a little bit of jargon. Uh, it's like a more general term than transaction. But this is a, another dispatchable, another type of transaction that someone could call from this palette. But this one just happens to emit an error in a certain circumstance. So that's just demonstrating that. So this is what a palette looks like and, and kind of shows you how you would start to begin to write your own palette. And now let's go look at the runtime. So I talked a lot about the outer runtime. This is where we define the outer runtime. And so let's kind of zoom down here towards the bottom. And so here we can see another Rust macro. This one we call it construct runtime. And that this name I like, this is a very evocative name. I have no complaints about this one. So what we're doing here is we are constructing a runtime by composing a number of palettes. And before we can include the palette in the runtime, we first need to wire together that configuration trait that we talked about. And so that's what we're doing here is like, for instance, all the transaction payment logic is all wrapped up and encapsulated in a single palette. And so of course that palette needs to have some concept of currency, like I talked about with um, smart contracts, for instance. And so here we're telling the transaction payment palette that the currency that you're using is the currency type is gonna be this balances. And so let's look and see what is balances. So here's the balances palette, and this defines a whole currency system. And so that is what the transaction payment palette is referring to. It needs some notion of the outer runtime's idea of the currency system. And so we bind to it the, the balances palette that we're using. And so that's what we're doing here in this, this file, implementing all of these palettes and then composing them using the construct runtime macro. And now let's go look one more level up. So we started at, with a palette, which is one individual module of runtime logic. Then we zoomed out to the composing the whole runtime from all of these modules. But there's all this other node stuff, the consensus and transaction pool and all this other stuff. And in the node template, because we're using so much boilerplate code, a lot of this is kind of wrapped up in some of these dependencies that we're pulling in. Um, but you can look deeper into this to kind of get a better sense of some of that. But what I really want to highlight I tend to stay close to the runtime level. That's what I understand best at this time. So 
one of the things that you want to often do is define your initial runtime state. Certainly when you're talking about development, you want to have pretty good control over what is the initial state of your blockchain. And you do that in a chain spec file. So this is the chain spec file for the node template. And so let's kind of, again, zoom down here to the bottom. So this is the function that we're going to end up calling to configure the Genesis storage for all of our different pallets. Again, this is kind of like a frame idiom that we're hooking into here, defining Genesis storage for all of the pallets. So this is the function where we kind of set that up. And you can see, for instance, for the balances pallet, we want to configure some accounts with some initial balance. And so this takes this function takes a vector of account IDs and then configures them with an initial balance. And so when you run a development chain, this is the function that's going to get called when you run the development chain. And then it in turn will call that function that we just looked at. And so it passes in some certain set of accounts to be pre-funded. It, it invokes that that Genesis function with these accounts. And you can define custom CLI parameters for a substrate node. And so this is where you would define those custom CLI parameters. But the CLI parameter that, that tells it to use this one is dash dash dev. When you use the dash dash dev CLI parameter and you start the node with that flag, it knows, okay, we're going to fund these accounts initially. So that is the chain spec. And that's kind of a really quick intro to the node template. Um, there's a lot of documentation here about the node template, kind of going over some of the stuff that I just talked about. To get started with the node template, I want you to go to substrate.dev and go to our tutorials. And I'm going to share this for you right now. Go to our tutorials. And I would say to really get a good understanding about Substrate and Frame, complete the first four tutorials. This first tutorial here is going to help you get your computer all set up. You know, it's basically like Hello World. And then these next three tutorials kind of really walk you through adding a pre-built palette to a runtime. Now we're going to, then the, in the next one, we teach you how to build a custom palette. And then in the fourth one, we walk you through these flows of upgrading a chain and really seeing that magic of a forkless runtime upgrade in action. So I think if you complete these first four tutorials, you'll have a really good kind of hands-on introduction to all of this stuff. Um, let's see, what else do I want to share with you while we're here? If you have any questions, while you're going through all of this. We have a really awesome technical chat. Peter uh, mentioned it at the beginning. Join our technical chat and ask me questions. I, I, you know, you may run into some problems building some things. I wish I could tell you we had like the world's best developer experience story. We're still getting there. So if you run into any snags along the way, hit me up, I'll help you get over it and, and you'll be off and building with Substrate in no time. Um, let me go back to my slides. Um, so the link that I shared for the tutorials, that's substrate.dev, that's like our developer portal. After you finish the first four tutorials and you're like, oh man, I got some ideas, but I'm not quite sure what to do, check out the recipes. And this is like common examples of like common patterns and examples working code of how to implement it. And, and that is linked here uh, from the recipes. There's a front end template, a lot like the node template that makes it really easy to build front ends. And actually we introduced that in the very first tutorial. And then the very last thing that I want to highlight is, you know, one of the best resources for building your own template or your own palette is to go and look, yes, thank you, Google, I know. You're redirecting me. Um, go and look in the core substrate repository. I'll share this with you all right now. But again, this is one of the links in the 
the um, slide so you have access to this. Go look at the substrate code base itself and see like, oh man, Dan was talking about that balances palette. What does that look like? And just go poke around and see what it looks like. Oh, sorry. I, it's really, really dry here. My nose is bothering me. Poke around the balances palette, um, you know, see what it looks like to implement a slightly more complex trait trait um and then maybe you're like okay so dan was talking about that that contracts palette but it's not in the node template because the node template's like really minimal but maybe you want to add the contracts palette to your node first of all there's a tutorial that teaches you how to do that but maybe you don't want to go through a whole tutorial maybe you just want to see it in action so another thing that i've linked from the slides it's right here this example node uh go to the substrate repo go check out node and then go to runtime, the runtime lib, that's like the main or whatever. And now you can see like, start searching in your browser if you're just looking in GitHub. Oh, look, this is how they implement the contracts palette. So, you know, you're gonna have to ask yourself when, when you wanna add a palette to your runtime, how do I start filling all this stuff in? It can be a little confusing. And we talk about it in those first four tutorials but like the contracts palette is a it's a pretty big complicated one and so you may want to look at an example of how to do that this example node here in the core substrate repo this is the place to go so i promise i'm almost done talking guys these are the template projects that we have for you i talked a lot about substrate.dev and the developer hub in particular i want to make sure that i'm sharing the awesome substrate repo with you guys for all my developers out there i'm sure you're you're very familiar with awesome repos so please check that out for lots of great resources we have some really important exciting events coming up uh, on Thanksgiving for, for everyone here in the US. We have Parody and Friends. Um, Pierre Krieger, who's one of our rock star developers, I'll go ahead and use that somewhat obnoxious term. Um, he's gonna be talking about a project that he's been working on called Substrate Light, which is another implementation of all of this stuff that we've been talking about, more pared down, so a little bit less flexible, but I'm really excited to, to learn about what Pierre did. He's a super smart guy, and it's going to help me get a better understanding of all of this stuff that we're talking about. So if, if 7 o'clock in California on Thanksgiving is not a great time for you, follow this link, and it'll be recorded afterwards, too. It's on Crowdcast, just like this. This is more information about the Industry Connect course. Someone already asked about that, but get more information here. And there's Polkadot Decoded. Um, here's Peter and I's contact information, and that's it. I told you I was almost done talking, and let's go check out your questions. Okay. Does Substrate support off-chain interactions? Yes, it does. Um, let's see, Peter, I'll go ahead and bring you back on screen, or, yeah, can you bring, I'll unmute you. I can't unmute Peter. Oh, there you are. But maybe you can unmute. Okay. Well, if you can unmute, I just won't have you like awkwardly there. That would be weird. Um, so uh, let's answer this uh, question here. Off-chain interactions. Yes. Um, Substrate has what's called off-chain workers. So I used to work in the Ethereum ecosystem with oracles. That was that was what I did. And that's kind of how off-chain interactions work in the Ethereum world. But in Polkadot and with Substrate, all of that is baked right into the protocol. So I'm not going to get too deep into off-chain workers right now, but it was considered from the ground up. So short answer to your question is yes. I wish I could give you the long answer, um, but join the technical chat and, and I'll definitely get into that. Thank you. I like my t-shirt too. Uh, could you share your thoughts about going about writing a Kafka connect to Polkadot connector? Let me share with you a little something that I know about. And I think this is what you're talking about. I, I don't have a lot to say about that question, Joy, but I'm going to share as a comment here 
something that I'm learning about, which is Project Auras, which is meant to be kind of a push notification, message queue. I believe that's what Kafka does. Um, so maybe check out Project Auras, and I'll, I'll go ahead and share that in the troll box too. I wish I had a better answer, um, but thank you for that question. Let's check out the next one here. Does Frame provide the metering accounting to charge for execution? Basically the gas equivalent. Yes, it definitely does, Servan. Uh, that's the weights that I was talking about. And there is a really great recent, um, so there's this uh, thing that I participate in called Substrate Seminar, which is a weekly web conference that we do. And Sean, did a good one recently about benchmarking. Oh, here it is, here it is. It was a marathon actually. Um, so here is that link for the benchmarking one. So the quick answer is weights are kind of the substrate equivalent of gas. And then the slightly longer answer, and you can go check out seminar number 19 to get the, the whole long answer, is there's a whole framework around benchmarking that allows you to determine the correct secure weight to use. And then with runtime upgrades, you that can change over time. So very good story around that and very good question. Is there a meaning behind the name frame? There is a meaning behind the name frame. It is the framework for the runtime aggregation of modularized entities. It's not a complete backronym, but it's a it's a bit of a backronym. It's it, it, basically it means it's a framework for building runtimes. The framework for the runtime aggregation of modularized entities. Good question. Are there any code walkthroughs or docs for the Parity Bridge Library? There absolutely are. I'm going to go back to that awesome substrate repo that I mentioned. And there's a recording section there. And I'm going to get the link for the bridges and cross-chain interoperability section that we did. That was number 12. Um, so Hernando talks all about our bridges library. There's a whole like, um, I'm going to get more. Yeah, there's a whole like uh, framework, a whole set of libraries around just bridges. And, and then there's a um, then there's a presentation about it too. So let me just share that one. There's that, there's the library. You can watch seminar number 12 to see Hernando talk about that. Can we get this in a Docker container? Oh, you know, I gotta say, as someone who does support, Docker is not one of my favorite things um, because I, I feel like Docker is just a recipe for support nightmares, but we do support Docker despite the fact that I may not always wish that we do. Uh, but you can run it in Docker, and I'm going to share that for you. So the node template you can run in Docker. Um, but my suggestion, especially because, you know, Substrate is it's so much about, like, networking and everything, and that's where docker i feel like it's always like oh you you haven't supported the right uh so you haven't exposed the right port or whatever um that's where it can get difficult with docker so just keep that in mind um and yeah i i like running things on bare metal personally but we do we do have it in a docker container awesome those were really great questions um we're we're finished right on time which is almost unbelievable. Um, if there's a few more questions, I certainly have time to like stick around and answer them. Um, but yeah, I think we covered a lot of ground today. I hope I got y'all excited about building with Substrate. I hope I see you around our technical chats. I see another question. How often does the Substrate API change? Is there any tool that allows us to move to new versions of Substrate? I heard Substrate is still under heavy development. So we released version 2.0 of Substrate in October. And in the, I would say in the six weeks leading up to 2.0, you could really feel that the API was stabilizing. And 
since 2.0, I think there has been a commitment around greater stability. Substrate is still under heavy development, but there are people like me within Parity that are pushing for friendly, stable APIs. So Polkadot Network is launched. We are in production on Substrate. And there are other teams like Centrifuge, Moonbeam, like that Peter mentioned, that are also in production. So, excuse me, um, the, the API does change. It, it doesn't change as often as it used to. And there are a lot of people that are working very hard to make sure that it doesn't change in breaking ways, myself included. Good question. What is the interaction like at Parity between engineers working on Parity, uh, Polkadot, and engineers working on Substrate? Um, yep, that is Polkadot Voices has a proposal at the Substrate level. Yes, so the first of all, everything that we do is open source. Of course, Parity does look after the Substrate and and official Polkadot client code bases very carefully. Um, but the network itself is fully decentralized. The Polkadot network has those pallets that we talked about. And so the governance of the network is completely within the control of the community as governed by this council, one of those collective pallets that we mentioned. And so like who's on that council? Gav is on the council. Some of our other core developers like uh, Sean Tabrizi are on the council. So there's definitely a connection between the governance body of the Polkadot network and the people implementing the Polkadot client and the substrate framework. So there is connection here, but implemented on top of the Polkadot network, the, these governance interactions and the way that these people interact with each other. And so in addition to using like kind of the more common centralized mechanisms of like PR pull requests on GitHub, uh, you can interact at the network governance level. So very good question. Obviously not a super clear, super straightforward answer. Unfortunately, decentralized governance is not the most straightforward thing to explain. Um, and that's why it's really important to have super clear, straightforward frameworks and primitives like we have with Frame. So really wonderful question. You're, you're definitely thinking about the right things. And I hope I've given you enough to, to wanna kind of learn a little bit more. Um, I would encourage you to, let me share um, a really great resource. The Polkadot Wiki is a really, really good place to go to learn about the governance of the Polkadot network in particular. Um, how to contribute to documentation. Oh, be still my beating heart. That's, oh, I love that. Uh, there's so many opportunities to contribute to documentation. Is there any bounty for it? I don't know about bounties at this time. I can personally promise that I would try to help you get a tip from the Kusama. Um, follow up with me personally, if you're interested in learning more about documentation opportunities, but let me just share. So I shared with, with you guys substrate.dev, which is our developer portal. This is the source code to substrate.dev. So if you see something in our documentation that you're like, oh, that's not right, or it could be more clear, you make a PR on this repo, and that's how you contribute to our documentation. Thank you so much for asking that question, Joy. I love that question. All right. Yes. Great questions. We're, we're officially over time. I don't have anything to do other than sit around and talk about Polkadot and Substrate. Thank you, Shreya. So awesome to work with you. Um, Actually, you know, just you know, as I kind of like wrap things up and, um, you know, make sure there aren't any last final questions, Shreya had asked us to highlight like projects in the ecosystem that are actually building on our technologies that we're really into. And one of the ones that I'm really into is um, the Kilt protocol. Let me let me get uh, the their website for you there. 
Kilt does decentralized identity. They're implementing it on Substrate. And, you know, we talk about like building a better internet and a more secure internet. And really the most important primitive is identity. And Kilt is a team that's building that. So uh, I'm kind of saying this to, I saw Shreya, I wanted to answer her question. Kilt is one of my favorite teams, building on, on Substrate, building for the Polkadot network. Um, so go look at Kilt. You have lots of homework. I gave you guys lots to look into. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. Thank you so much for, for listening to me. I hope I got you excited, and I hope to see you all around. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a nice evening or nice day, wherever you may be.